This episode of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is brought to you by Remade, a sci-fi thriller for fans of Lost and the Maze Runner. Remade is a production of Serial Box, which brings you serialized fiction from teams of today's best writers. To get a discount on the first season of any Serial Box series, visit SerialBox.com and use the promo code GEEK18. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 291 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is David Ignatius, a Washington Post reporter who's covered foreign affairs and the intelligence community for over 30 years. He's also the author of 10 spy novels, including Body of Lies, which was adapted into a 2008 film starring Russell Crowe and Leonardo DiCaprio. And we'll be speaking with him today about his new novel, The Quantum Spy, about the race between the U.S. and China to develop the world's first quantum computer. And today's show is brought to you by Remade, about a group of teenagers searching for answers in the wreckage of human civilization, all while being hunted by machines. Remade is a production of Serial Box, a new company that brings you serialized fiction from teams of today's best writers. The team behind Remade includes Matthew Cody, Andrea Phillips, Gwen DeBond, Carrie Harris, New York Times bestseller Kirsten White, and E.C. Myers, who was our guest back in episodes 64 and 87. And here's a description of the book. It says, In one moment, the lives of 23 teenagers are forever changed, and it's not just because they all happen to die. Remade, in a world they barely recognize, one with robots, space elevators, and unchecked jungle, they must work together to survive. They came from different places, backgrounds, and families, and now they might be the last people on Earth. Lost meets the Maze Runner in this exciting adventure from Serial Box Publishing. Number one New York Times bestseller James Dashner, author of the Maze Runner series, writes, Sharply told in a fantastic new format, Remade should be on your radar. And Wired.com writes that Remade is, quote, sure to be a hit with fans of dystopian YA fiction. So if that sounds like your sort of thing, you can join the plot with Serial Box right now. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy listeners can get a discount on the first season of any Serial Box series by going to SerialBox.com and entering the promo code GEEK18. So that's S-E-R-I-A-L-B-O-X.com, and the code is GEEK18. Remade is also available as a free podcast narrated by Greg Tremblay and Laurel Schrode, so definitely check that out as well. All right, so now let's get to our interview. All right, so we're here with David Ignatius. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Good to be with you. Okay, so your new book is called The Quantum Spy. So how did this book come about? This book began uh, really with my reading one of the many uh, revelations that came from Ed Edward Snowden. Uh, we published in the Washington Post a, a note uh, uh, that as part of the so-called black budget, the uh, authorization for spending on various uh, covert projects. Um, the NSA had been spending uh, for uh, a quantum computing research. This was uh, a, a budget uh, dating back before Snowden, so it was probably around 2012. But I hadn't been aware that quantum computing research was a priority for the intelligence community, and that made me curious. And I just began uh, looking into it, and it was obvious that there was this uh, important new technology that had the potential to uh, significantly alter uh, the uh, ability to decrypt communications, to, in a sense, dominate uh, digital space. Uh, that seemed fascinating. And then uh, as I dug into it a little further, it became clear that the U.S. was in a race, almost a kind of Manhattan Project-like uh, race, to develop this technology, and our principal rival was China. Uh, China had always interested me as a topic. Um, the Chinese intelligence service gets very little attention in spy novels. We know everything about Russia, the KGB. Uh, you know, we almost know our way through Moscow Center thanks to John Le Carre. But we don't know much about China, so I thought this would be an interesting new uh, thing to write about. So that's how the book got started. Yeah, well, so you say this is kind of like a new Manhattan Project, and in the book jacket it says the winner of the race to build the world's first quantum computer will attain global dominance for generations to come. Is that hyperbole, or is that the actual state of affairs right now? I think it's it's probably slightly hyperbolic. Um, authors don't write headlines <laughs> or, or jacket cover, um, but I, I do think that it will be a significant 
uh, area of um, te technological mastery, um, I don't want to say dominance, one thing that makes um, the uh, power of quantum computing in the intelligence area hard to predict is that even as uh, quantum uh, decryption um, uh, uh, moves forward, so will quantum encryption. The Chinese have spent a lot of time trying to um, uh, show that they can, in effect, um, have quantum communication systems, that they can entangle their qubits uh, across space, across hundreds of kilometers. So uh, whether the advances in quantum encryption uh, will defeat advances in quantum decryption would take a much better uh, technologist than me. But uh, it, it is clear that anything that requires computational power, and so many things in the world of defense and intelligence do, um, will be affected by the development of a real quantum computer. And so in that sense, yeah, I, I have no question that it will be, um, it will be a, a significant advance, whether it's equivalent to nuclear weapons, hard to say. Well, yeah, and just to give listeners a sense of how fast these computers would be, uh, one of the characters in the book says, we currently estimate that it would take a classical computer more than 10 million years to factor a 50-digit number, whereas it would take less than a second on a quantum computer. That's a, a statement that was made to me by one of the researchers who's deeply involved in quantum computing research for one of the major U.S. Uh, computer companies. Um, uh, so I I'm, felt comfortable putting it putting in the book. Uh, wired readers should, you know, podcast listeners should should offer their own thoughts about whether they think that's an accurate estimate. But the point is, it's an, it orders of magnitude faster than any existing supercomputer or array. Right. Well, so you, yeah, so I guess you talked to a bunch of experts for this. You want to talk about that process of going around? Like, who did you talk to? So uh, in every uh, novel that I write, uh, because I, I'm interested in writing realistic um, uh, spy novels, realistic f fiction, I do a, a process of research that's almost like reporting, as I would for, for the newspaper, uh, and try to figure out who are the people who really know something about this, who can explain it to me in terms that I can understand as a layman, non-technologist, and then can uh, can described to, to readers. So in, in this case, um, as I say in the acknowledgments to the book, I started with somebody I'd known for some years uh, who has been very helpful to journalists on lots of subjects, and that's Craig Mundy, uh, former chief technology officer at Microsoft. And uh, Craig was said he was would be willing to sit down and uh, talk to me and also um, uh, introduce me to Microsoft's uh, team at what they call Station Q at the University of California at Santa Barbara. So um, I went out to Seattle and um, using uh, BTC teleconference, talked with Michael Friedman, who is part of their team, who is a brilliant physicist who's working on their approach to a woman named Krista Svor, who is working for Microsoft uh, and is trying to write a language uh, that will be used to program uh, their uh, idea for a quantum computer, which involves a complicated uh, braiding uh, on nanowires of qubits in a way that will make them more stable. So I talked to, to Krista Sfor. Uh I uh, got back to Craig and said, I'd love to use this material in a fictional way, um, drawing on the conversations. And that was fine. They were kind enough just to, to review the basic uh, way I was summarizing it. Similarly, uh, I got interested in, in a company called D-Wave, uh, which um, it claims that it's already built a quantum computer. There's a lively uh, uh, debate that's been going on for a decade about whether D-Wave's computer really is a quantum computer or is instead a quantum annealer uh, using annealing technology to, in effect, solve optimization problems. I guess I, at the end of uh, my visit to Vancouver, British Columbia, talking to them, seeing their machine, uh, uh, doing a lot of reading, come down with the people who think that, yeah, it's, it's an annealer, but boy, it's pretty powerful uh, based on what I, what I heard and saw and read. Uh, so that was useful. And then there was a final uh, research uh, set of visits uh, to IARPA, uh, which does a lot of unclassified funding of uh, 
quantum computer uh, research and to uh, one of the uh, recipients of I IARPA funding at the University of Maryland, where they're doing um, have an extensive quantum computing center and are doing uh, work on what they call a single ion or ion trap approach to entangling qubits. So in, in those different ways and lots of others I could describe, I, I just tried to read into the subject. Um, as I say, I, I am, it's, uh, I'm not a technologist, so my biggest fear is I'm going to make a really stupid mistake in writing about things that I, that I'm just learning about. I think the stuff is fascinating. I, I hope I didn't uh, make any uh, howler mistakes. I haven't uh, gotten letters from anybody yet saying that you know it's on page 250 is an absolutely preposterous statement. So uh, hopefully there's nothing too, too wrong. But uh, again, for for me and I hope for readers, the fun of this is. Uh, discovering um, uh, a little bit about very complicated technologies uh, that you didn't know about before. Now, so the quantum annealer that exists in real life at D-Wave, does it have applications currently, like you describe in the book, with the pattern matching, facial recognition kind of stuff? So there's, a, again, a lively debate about how useful it is, and I don't know all the specific research that they do, but I, I do know that some uh, companies um, uh, have... Uh, bought D-Wave machines and are using them uh, for optimization type problems and trying to tune the D-Wave uh, computer, which has got a lot of qubits. They, they're now selling machines that have more than 2,000 qubits operating um, to, 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 to do this approach. And from what I read, and again, your listeners need to, to say whether they think this is, this, is, this is right or not. From what I read, the evidence is growing stronger that there are quantum effects in their annealing approach. For a long time, people said, well, you know, a simulated annealer could do it almost as well. And is this really, but the, the evidence that, that there are um, some uses of the D-Wave machine that are very powerful, uh, perhaps involving the kind of pattern, pattern recognition uh, problems that I describe in the book, I think that evidence is growing. I heard you say that sort of in the time that you've been following this, that people used to say we would have a quantum computer maybe in 20 years, and then it became 10 years, and then now it's kind of five years. I, I have heard that, um, and as with anything like this, you know the, the 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 precision is spurious. Who can who can say about an unknown when an unknown will be solved? But um, it does seem like some of the harder problems uh, have so much have so many um, uh, uh, smart ways of attack now that I do I do hear uh, more optimism than I did when I began research on the book. Uh, initially, it's it's it, it what I would hear back from technologists was a uh, fascinating if fascinating if it if it works and i hear more now f fascinating w uh, when it works there's a sense that these problems probably can be solved not least because the chinese uh, if you read the chinese literature uh, or chinese descriptions of what they're what they're doing uh, they they're now getting very optimistic about their quantum computing uh, program um, which is very robust and they're talking about being able to have a machine that works uh, within this sh shorter time frame. I mean, because one of the applications you describe in the book is, quote, designer drugs to cure any disease. Are, are we looking at that kind of thing in the next 10 or 20 years? Well, if, if a programmable uh, quantum computer of the sort that people are trying to build can be created, there's no, there's no question that it can do computation uh, at a level uh, that allows in, in, in looking at drug design and looking at material science, you know, very complicated uh, problems um, will be much more um, uh, soluble. And, and so it, it is a, it is a, a, a different kind of world, as I say, and anything that involves computation. I think one of the uh, biggest challenges that I uh, became aware of as I did my research is that uh, the qubits that you're counting on to do this extraordinary uh, computation, because they have this zero and one simultaneous uh, nature, um, they're so fragile, and the, the issue really has been not simply how do you entangle qubits, but how do you keep them from um, from decohering, from vanishing after after milliseconds? How do you keep them stable enough, protected enough from outside uh, disturbance that they can actually do some computation for you? I think that's the interesting problem, and it seems, from my perspective as an outsider, where 
that that's where some progress is being made. A lot of this, the environments in which these ships are going to operate are cryogenic. They're super cold, um, in part to protect them against outside interference. There are other ways of shielding that people are working on, as as with Microsoft's idea of essentially braiding these into into materials. So. Um, it, it, to the, to the extent that the problem of decoherence, the, the qubits falling apart can be solved, then I think um, the possibility of having a, a stable enough com- platform to do computing. And, and I guess the final thing that everybody worries about is that the error rates have seemed to be very high. So you have to match your quantum computer with a classical computer that can detect and correct errors. My sense from reading the literature from afar is that there's been some progress in that area as well. I mean, in the book, you quote Richard Feynman. He says, uh, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't understand quantum mechanics. Is that still the attitude of the, the researchers that you're yeah, talking to? I think, I think I'm, I'm living proof of that. If, if <laughs> I'm talking to your listeners and, and pretending that I understand this, um, I don't understand it. Um, the, as, as people have spent uh, time in laboratories um, trying to work on these problems, my sense is that it's gone from uh, you know something that's utterly mysterious to something that's that's just super difficult, but but it, but but seems in the realm of problems that can be solved. Uh, that that, uh, that the the pathways to solving them uh, now appear more open. It's not just a big kind of cliff, and you know, let's take a leap and figure out what's at, what's at the bottom. Yeah. Well, so so the character in this book who's working on quantum computing, or one of them anyway, is named Jason Schmidt. Uh, he's the, the sort of like the D-Wave kind of company, I guess. Is that um, is he based particularly on any actual researchers? No, he's not. He's not. A, he, he's a, he's a, an imagined character. The the technology that he's working with is um, similar to the D-Wave and annealing technology, um, and um, with the D-Wave's help, I was able to. T- to look at the way in which they um, uh, c- cool their their um, uh, uh, chips uh, down to super low uh, temperature, uh, d- down in the teens of millikelvins, just above absolute zero. I, I was told, as a character in the book is told, that the point at which this chip um, uh, is 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 being held in this super cold state is is the coldest point in the universe. I, I'm sure that's not precisely true, but but it it, it is said to be uh, temperatures that are lower than the temperatures in deep space. So uh, it's it's an extraordinary environment, and again, the ability to kind of master that environment, uh, feel comfortable over time with the cryogenics that allow you to establish and then sustain super low temperatures. That's pretty interesting stuff. Um, I, I, one thing I was struck by is that uh, building a quantum computer, computer is going to take people through um, uh, other areas of sort of enabling uh, technology that will in themselves uh, be powerful, uh, regardless of the quantum computer. Well, I mean, one thing that the Jason Schmidt character says that kind of struck me is he's asked what sort of resources he needs from the government. And he says, let's be honest, there aren't enough smart Americans. Could you talk about that? Well, I, I think um, one uh, issue that we see in, in the whole debate about uh, getting uh, visas for uh, super smart scientists to come work in American labs is um, the, the number of uh, American citizens who can do uh you know, very high-end research who who also can easily get um, security clearances is is, is limited. Um, you know, the the tech companies have, have made a, a a point about this repeatedly, and I guess I just if he's making that wisecrack, what he's saying is something that I think a lot of people feel, which is that American science, uh, the, the technical, mathematic uh, education, uh, the, our, our, the ability of our schools to produce. American students at world class level. That's an important national challenge. Um, he's being flip about it, but I think it's something that we all take seriously. It's just it's a tough nut to crack. I mean, what role do, do you think that American culture plays a role in that? I mean, I'm always struck that uh, in American schools, being good at math will get you teased, if not physically assaulted. And I, my sense anyway, I don't know, but my sense is that it's not that way in other in China, for example. 
I think you're right. I think um, it's a little cooler to be a geek than it used to be. Um, you know, I think every um, desperate teenager wants some level to be cool, but and it's you know it's 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 cooler to be seen as 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 proficient in these areas. Also, there there are now subcultures that give people some social support if if they're um, you know geeky, nerdy, they're good at math, don't want to play sports. Uh, they're, they don't feel like they're shunned uh, to the outer edge of the universe. So I, I think that's that's um, uh, that's a step forward. The, the problem is the world is educating young students uh, in math and science with such intensity. When I traveled to China to Japan and happened to see students, I'm just always amazed at the at just how um, rigorous their their classical math science training is compared to American students. What they don't have, and this is, you know, while well, it used to be our secret sauce, what they often don't have is the kind of creativity, the 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 uh, uh, willingness to take risks, that American uh, entrepreneurial spirit. It, they come out of pretty regimented classroom situations, and somehow the life is often squeezed out of students in these uh, uh, school systems overseas. It's, uh, it's true in Europe as well. I think that's, uh, I've seen that in France uh, also. Uh, so um, the sweet spot for us is somehow to be rigorous enough in giving people the basics and also loose enough in letting people experiment with them and uh, uh, be creative. Uh, I mean, there isn't still anything in the world like Silicon Valley. That tells us something. There's some some secret sauce that America's still got that allows us to to take um, what smart people uh, think up and, and turn it into, into uh, products that you can use and, and, and sell. But, but the basics that, that, that you have to start with, the, the basic math science education, uh, you know, the U.S. just has got to get better at it, no question about it. Yeah. Have you seen this clip where uh, a reporter randomly asks Justin Trudeau, Joke as a joke, if you could describe how a quantum computer works, and he extemporizes a very creditable, uh, you know, layman's description of it. Have you seen that clip? I have not. I have not seen that clip, and I, I, I should look at that. I noted uh, just doing some reading the other day that uh, Xi Jinping, some years ago, had visited a quantum computing uh, research facility and had kind of read into what quantum computing was all about in the process of making a commitment at the top level. Uh, of the Chinese leadership that China was going to be good at this. Um, it's hard to imagine a similar um, moment in, in the U.S., but we could use one. Well, yeah, that's that's yeah. I was going to say it makes watching that clip. You can't help but think what how many American politicians would be able to provide even that level of uh, description of pretty much any scientific topic. And I mean that you know a couple um, a couple months ago, I interviewed this young woman, Jess Phoenix. She's running for Congress in California, and she's a scientist. And there's this whole, you know, I'm sure you know, movement now of scientists who are running for public office because they're so disheartened by the lack of just basic scientific awareness uh, in Congress and so on. Have you, I, I assume you've kind of been following that? I have. I've been following it vaguely, and I think it's great. I, you know, the... the, the um, you know, when adherents... Of the fact-based, you know, reason-based, uh, educated and proud of it world begin to fight back and say, "No, wait a minute, you know, uh, we're not going to uh, throw climate science or, or or any other aspect of our of our uh, fact-based uh, uh, tradition overboard." Uh, that's that's um, that's going in the right direction. I see lots of evidence of people, um, you know, uh, people with good values in the military who want to run for office. Um, uh, Seth Moulton, a member of Congress from Massachusetts, has got, has got raised a whole fund, hundreds of thousands of dollars to help other smart, um, well-motivated people who serve in the military know about those things, but also want to have, want a better country um, uh, to enable them to run. Um, the, the idea that people from the tech and science world are similarly want to get into politics. They see that um, I, operating in complete isolation from politics allows politics to get infected uh, in a way that ends up damaging our, the, whole, the whole of our public um, space, our public ecosystem. So yeah, fight back.
Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of climate change, I mean, my understanding, too, is that China is investing big, not just in quantum computing, but in solar as well. And we're in a position where we might be buying solar panels from China in a few years if we're not uh, investing in that. We might well be be buying uh, solar solar panels from them. I mean, they have a particular urgent need. If you've traveled to China any time recently, you have that memory of just choking, feeling like you're chewing the air. Uh, I was in China a year ago, Christmas, and uh, it was one of those um, moments, both in in Beijing and Shanghai, where the they you couldn't see a block because of the the pollution of the air. Um, the U.S. Um, thank goodness, um, decades ago began to deal with a problem of air and water pollution in a way that, that makes our country cleaner and healthier, even with all the re- recent uh, setbacks. And it, you know, so the Chinese have an urgent problem when it comes to developing uh, solar um, cleaner technologies. They're, they're choking on their success. And Chinese people are angry about it. Uh, so that doesn't, does, I, I don't worry about us losing a race to develop solar panels because, you know, I mean, if we're, it's a great market. If we're, if we're, you know, uh, you'd think American companies wanting to make, wanting to make money would chase that market knowing it's going to be a big one. But uh, if, I'm glad the Chinese are going after it. Yeah. All right. Well, so going back to this Jason Schmidt character for a second, um, there's a line where you say uh, he wasn't a man who had romantic ideas about a technological Arcadia. He thought that Edward Snowden was a self-deluding traitor. Um, could you just talk a little bit about that, that, those lines? Um, so he, this is a guy who is, uh, as those lines uh, say, um, is 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 um, you know he's not a, 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 a radical libertarian. He is not a, a, a Snowden fan. He ends up working on a project with the government in part because he believes that's the right thing to do. Um, the you know the the lines. I mean, they, they mean what they say, and they're a description of that of that character. Because there is sort of this theme in the book of should the science be put to national interest, or should it there be sort of an international scientific community that's all working on this together and sharing information? And there's this sort of tension between those two things. Um, so I think that's one of the, the the things I most want readers to take away from, take away from the book. Um, I'll mention a couple of others in a minute, but um, one of the issues that is woven through this novel is how the United States government should oversee technology in areas that have uh, important national security implications. And there's basically an argument that's going on in the book between people in the in the private sector, people working in, in technology companies, um, who say this has to stay open. The, the reason it's dynamic, the reason we create, the reason that we've been dominant is because we're an open country. We're in our labs. We get the smartest people. And we don't ask them, are you Chinese? Or are you, are you, are you, we just get the smartest uh, graduate students and postdocs. And, and we, yeah, we don't interrogate them. We don't close, uh, uh, control their information. And then there's another argument that comes from the intelligence community that says uh, in, in areas where, um, the technology has enormous implications for our security relative to other countries. We do need to uh, make sure we're controlling um, aspects of this technology to the extent that they're funded by the government. And so we're going to do special government funding of this technology and this pathway. And um, we're going to uh, apply the appropriate controls and classify it and, and, so that's an ongoing argument in, in, in the book. And one nice thing about being a novelist as opposed to being a columnist is you don't have to resolve that argument. Uh, the, the, I think the different uh, viewpoints about that are presented in the book. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the, the, my uh, lead character, Harris Chang, who's a Chinese-American uh, CIA officer who's assigned the task of trying to penetrate the Chinese, I think it's fair to say that he ends up deciding that a more open world um, where you're, um, you know, you're, you're in, in this intelligence community, but also in a larger world, that's where he wants to live. And that, that, that's, really that, that's the arc of the novel, the story of how he, how he gets to that point. Um, 
but but I the uh, what I'd like people to to think about in in the book is is this question if we need if we need some controls what should they be how do you have how do you how do you um, limit the flow of information that could be damaging to the country without choking off what's what what makes America dynamic and successful. I mean, what do you think is the most compelling argument for loosening government controls over sharing of information? You, um, Some of the scientists in this book, they talk about this guy, Majorana, um, as an example of kind of the transnational sort of idealistic scientist. I think the arguments for have for for loosening controls really are the world that we've been we've been living in in, uh, the, in terms of IT advances. If you look at a company like like Google, if you look at Microsoft, look at the leadership of Microsoft, you see that a dynamic global company that recruits the best talent from all over. Um, you know, it may have proprietary secrets, but it does it. it, it Microsoft, um, uh, while it is uh, Worked with the government on on different sorts of projects has been very much a private company and uh, has tried to to stay open to the market, open to its customers. Uh, you know, it's, uh, have an open uh, development and interface for for software developers. Um, I think things that are closed and you just all you have to do is look at the Pentagon and the s- slowness with which the Pentagon in some areas has adapted the new technology to see the dangers of operating in this closed ecosystem. It's just too slow. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't take advantage of, of the dynamism that we see coming out of Silicon Valley and all the other tech centers in the U S. So, um, I, I, I think it, it, the dilemma is if we look back, um, to let's say the Manhattan project, you know, here's a, probably unique situation where a super dangerous weapon that could change the outcome of a war between the U.S. and Nazism um, it, it depends on our ability to exploit scientific talent uh, and, and rapidly um, uh, develop and build uh, weapons. And you would, you would have wanted, I think a reasonable person would have wanted controls on the flow of that information. It turned out they didn't work. It turned out that the Manhattan Project was thoroughly penetrated by the Russians, that they knew uh, you know, an awful lot of what we were doing in real time because of people who were secretly agents inside that. So you know, the, the questions about security of information aren't, aren't trivial. That example tells us that. Uh, again, I just come back to what I said earlier. The nice thing about being a novelist is you don't have to have a paragraph at the end that says, and so the correct answer to this problem is such and such. Because I don't know the correct answer. Uh, I, I know I, I know as a novelist how to describe the parameters of it, but I don't want to have to tell you what, what the answer is. Like you, you, you read the book. I, I, I'd, I'd love to know what your answer is because I'm still I'm struggling with it. Yeah, no, I mean, it's a very difficult question. But I think the what the characters were getting at with this example of Mayorana is that if you're a top scientist, you might find yourself working for a government that you don't want to give this technology to. And one example, uh, one advantage of having a more transnational approach, maybe, is that the it uh, mitigates the badness of any specific government that any specific scientist might be working for. I think that that's um, Myron is a fascinating example. There is a whole uh, literature, almost cult, about how it is that he he disappeared. Uh, was it because he he he, he concluded that his brilliant uh, Innovations in physics were being were being used by the Nazis. Uh, did that drive him to suicide? It's one of one of the uh, little historical uh, uh, mystery. I think um, talking about a, an open world um, is important, and it's like what Americans do. That's like how we think of the world. We do have to remind ourselves that that's not how China thinks about the world. China thinks about the world. Uh, in terms of Chinese interests, in terms of it's happy to share our technology and you know find out as much as it can about the, uh, the pathways that we're choosing to get get to uh, technological breakthroughs, but it doesn't want to share a lot of its own um, advances. 
And uh, China is a much more controlling, much less open society. Uh, the way in which China operates the internet is a good some sort of lesson for us about about how, about how they behave. So it's 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 tricky. We want to live in an open world, and yet we want to be smart enough to understand that not everybody is operating by the same rules. What do we do in that situation? How much are we giving up? Are we, you know, when are the moments when, when we as a country, when our best top companies, our best scientists are in effect being played for suckers and their intellectual property, their breakthroughs are, are essentially being um, uh, stolen, are being taken uh, by by whatever means people can come up with that. Again, that's one of the themes of this book. That's happening to Jason, Jason Schmidt, my uh, entrepreneur. Somebody's trying to get into his company, get, you know, get, get control of it if they can, get his secrets. Uh, and so that's, I think that's the, it's the tension between the world we want to live in that's open and the world that is where a lot of other c- countries um, don't really play by those rules. Well, when you talk about the penetration of the Manhattan Project, in spite of all the massive security precautions, it kind of raises the issue to me is how concerned do we need to be about who develops this quantum computing technology first? Because isn't everyone else just going to steal the technology pretty quickly as soon as it gets developed? Um, That's one of the um, uh, answers I came toward as I I was working on this book is – in the end, the the, the power of, the, of of mastery of quantum computing may not last very long because because it will be shared because the the others will understand the technology. You, you can't keep something uh, like that secret forever, um, and, and I, I think that I think that's a fair point. Um, it doesn't mitigate the concerns of somebody who would say uh, the. The first person that has a, a computer that really can apply uh, Shor's algorithm, which is the famous um, posits that you essentially can can decrypt, um, can factor any number and, and de- decrypt any any encryption s- scheme. The first person that gets that is going to be able to essentially go through every secret message, not to mention payments transaction. Um, and for a time, um, uh, have mastery of that, and then and then operate with that knowledge. So uh, you know, I get why people are, are anxious about it. I think in the long run, the point you make is is correct that it, it's it, it's hard. I want to say impossible to imagine the secret of quantum computing remaining the province of one set of wizards, one country, exclusively uh, for very long. Yeah. I also wanted to ask you about this character, Carlos Wang, I thought was a really interesting character. He's described as being a deviationist. Could you talk about that? Well, Carlos Wang is, uh, was a fun character to in- invent. Um, he is a Chinese intelligence officer who spent so much time operating in Mexico, which is, is said to be an area where the Chinese like to uh, operate, especially against American targets, because they have more freedom of, of action. There's no FBI uh, uh, snooping all the time. Um, uh, Carl Swang has um, deviationist, that is to say, um, left wing, kind of libertarian, Trotskyite ideas. Libertarian is the wrong word, probably, but he, lo- one scene in the book, he goes to the Trotsky Museum in Mexico City where Trotsky was killed, uh, but where after he, he fled the Soviet Union, he, he hung out and he, he has a kind of devotional tour of this of this museum. Uh, he, 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 he carries himself like a Chinese Che Guevara. He has, he has uh, as, as you said, he has deviationist ideas. Um, he, what he also has is a really subtle, uh, supple sense of how to work people and manipulate them. And without giving away all the details of the book, there's an encounter between him and Harris Chang, the CIA officer of Chinese ancestry, which um, you know, I, I, I hope will show readers the, the way in which intelligence services, Chinese intelligence service in particular, plays on ethnicity, plays on people's histories, um, personal details to try to elicit their cooperation. Uh, I think that's um, you know whether 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 there's anybody in the Chinese intelligence service just like Carlos Wang, I, I doubt, but um, but I'm sure they use similar techniques. Yeah. Well, so, th- so this character, he quotes Trotsky as saying, 
Man will become immeasurably stronger, wiser, and subtler. His body will become more harmonized, his movements more rhythmic, his voice more musical. The forms of life will become dynamically dramatic. The average human type will rise to the heights of an Aristotle, a Goethe, or a Marx. And above this ridge, new peaks will rise. Could you just talk about why you wanted to include that um, paragraph? So that's one of my favorite uh, uh, quotes from Trotsky, who was a fascinating character. When I was in college, I read a three-volume uh, biography of of Trotsky by Isaac Deutscher, and uh, that particular um, uh, a line, uh, the average man will rise to the heights of a Goethe, Marx, a Freud, and above this ridge, new peaks will rise. I, was, I thought that was like, you know, incredible uh, piece of language. Or something else I remember from that book um, was Deutscher's description of Trotsky as uh, a tiny boat with a huge sail. In other words, an enormous intellect. He was a genuinely brilliant uh, man, but um, uh, a limited political base, uh, and he ended up, as we saw, getting swamped and essentially uh, driven into, into exile. So you know, I think that's an example of the, part of the fun of it being a novelist. You just take little bits of your intellectual um, experience, a, a book, a biography that you read when you were in college, a place that you visited once on vacation, a, 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 an idea about how China, Chinese intelligence officers would operate in the mountains of Mexico. You just sort of put all that stuff together and um, try to, uh, you know, try to make it work in terms of characters and, and, and plot. But uh, anyway, I'm glad you read that passage because it's, it's, it's one that I particularly like in the book. Yeah, when it kind of strikes me as resonating with the transhumanist movement today, this idea that we could use biology or technology to dramatically boost human health or intelligence and so on. Is that an idea that uh, resonates with you at all? Uh, it, 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 it interests me, but it's, it scares me. Uh, the uh, Trotsky's evocation um, of this future, you know, the average becomes the superhuman and above that we create uh, even it was part of um you know the somewhat mechanistic deterministic view of history that that uh marxist leninists had that his, history was was driven by technology by the means of production but it just means technology and that it was a sort of ever ascending pyramid of uh of of human advancement uh, uh based on uh the the economic substructure. I just don't, I don't, I mean, I understand all the uh, excitement about, about a future where we have smarter, better people, but I, I'm not sure that I, I believe that myself uh, or even that I want to live in that world, just as I wouldn't want to live in a, in a, in a Marxist Leninist, the communist world that was driven by this deterministic sense of, of history. I, just, I don't, I, I, uh, the idea that history is an ascending arc, that there's a right side of history and a wrong side of history. I just don't believe that anymore. Um, I think history is recursive. It, it's um, yeah, it, it, I, I, in our in our time right now, we're seeing um, things that I could never have imagined a few years ago in terms of, of public statements by senior officials, not just from the White House, but all over the government. I, I just so. Um, these idea, these mechanistic models that posit advance um, and a future that we're going to engineer where people are smarter and better. Man, I, I stop believing that. I mean, it seems I, I hear what you're saying, but it seems if you take a longer view that if you compare people today for all our faults to people centuries ago, just the level of um, religious and racial tolerance is, is just something that would have been unimaginable, you know, in the 16th century or something. And... I think, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's true in, in certain levels, certainly in terms of how we think about gender. Uh, I think also in terms of how we think about race, um, the, our, the generation of America's founders, um, you know, were, were more tolerant, were smarter, were wiser, and our world is better. Um, but, you know, when you read, um, the exchanges between Adams and Jefferson and their letters. You, you read about this sort of, this is a world um, in the uh, Enlightenment and in the late uh, uh, 18th century where, where people really felt they could master every aspect of knowledge. 
uh, and um, and they they're just as extraordinary as someone someone like Jefferson, who was a, truly a polymath. He knew something about everything, which was something you could dream of in those days. Our our world, um, the, the the sense of of, of reason. Um, the application of reason to problems that that was so profound for that, that generation of America's founders. I think we live in a in a world where we see unreason uh, much more evident in, in so many areas. So yeah, I mean there are ways in which we've learned a lot about tolerance. You know, back then they had slaves. They may have been you know thinking big ideas about the Enlightenment, but they also were keeping slaves. I get I get that. It's just. Um, uh, Looking at their confidence in 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 reason, I mean the the degree to which they were willing to depart from traditional ideas about religion. I, uh, the, I mean Jefferson, for his day, was pretty bold. He was he was, you know, a, th- a theist. He didn't he didn't you know he didn't want to talk about the Trinity or any of the traditional doctrines of his church. He he had a, he just had a, a different bolder view. Uh, we see less of that, I think. Well, but I don't know. My impression is that we just got really lucky as a country that those people, you know, among the smartest, most rational, scientifically minded, liberal, et cetera, people in the country just happen to all be in positions of power at the same time. And, uh, you know, you, uh, that we, uh, hopefully we'll get we'll get that lucky again at some point. Well, that's you know, that's the part of me that's an optimist feels exactly the same way. I, I think there are no problems that the United States has now that. Um, couldn't be solved by good, by better leadership, by smarter, wiser, more tolerant people who are real leaders who, who pull the country back together. Um, but we you know we just have been through a period where Barack Obama was you know, one of the intellectually you know, one of the smartest people I, I've encountered in public life. Uh, he had really good values. He sought to communicate those good values. But uh, he, I think. Uh, 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 Obama would be the first to say that at the end of his eight years as president, the country was probably more divided than it was when he took office. Well, why was that? Um, you know, why couldn't this really smart, really decent person be the leader who could pull the country together? And there are a lot, lots of answers to that. Um, um, but one of them is that he wasn't um, a great politician. You know, he had many skills. He wasn't a great politician. That, that sort of wet, uh, you know, jump into the crowd, grab everybody, hmm. pull them together. That wasn't his thing. And somehow, um, if we're going to get back on track, and I, I do think America is off track, boys, that scare me. We need somebody who has the brilliance and, you know, t- enlightened, tolerant views of, of, a, of an Obama, but also has, has real leadership gifts. We can speak to, speak to, um, you know, sp- speak to that big part of America that feels left out, that's angry, it feels like, you know, they've gotten screwed in the last, in these in these years of technological advance, people who think they don't want to talk to Wired Magazine readers or podcast listeners, they're angry. So somehow, uh, the person who's going to pull a country back together has to, I think, has to be able to speak to them too. Well, I think it would have helped if we had a president like Obama, and then he had a hundred scientists in Congress backing him up, you know, I mean... Uh, amen. I mean, the more scientists in Congress, the better. Um, but I want them to be scientists who are good politicians. That you know, what's cool about what you said—the the interest of scientists in running for office—is that they'll they may not start out as great politicians, but the, the best of them will become very good politicians. You know, it's the process. The person who emerges you know, through a series of races for for Congress, let's say, and then a series of a, a committee assignments and who learns all those kind of unpleasant things that politicians have to do and gets good at them. Well, that's the person I want to put some money on. Yeah. All right. So we're running a little short on time. And I did also want to ask you about another Leon Trotsky quote, funny enough. But um, you say that Trotsky wrote that art wasn't a mirror to reflect life. It was a hammer to pound life into a different shape. Do you uh, agree with that? Um. So I agree that Trotsky said that. I, the, I, I, I mean, I, that idea of art and culture is, is what I find abhorrent about the communist way of looking at the world. Um, it, it, art isn't a hammer. Art, art is, um, I don't know what tool it is, but, um, you know, maybe it's a harpsichord, but it's certainly not a hammer. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, again, one of the things that I looked at in college was the way in which, um, 
uh, extremist groups, both uh, fascists uh, and communists, saw art, uh, saw culture in, in instrumental terms to create the Superman, to create uh, you know the the new man and woman, the new world. Uh, this you know idea of, of of culture as a hammer or even as a screwdriver. No, it doesn't have to. I, I, that's not what I I I I, I think it's about. Um, and uh, I go back to this research I did in college about about the links between the futurists, which was a wonderful Italian uh, movement. Uh, uh, many of the uh, sculptors uh, whose uh, work we we see in the galleries. Um, you know, were were from that period, and they were just in love with the future, with speed. Uh, there was a, a famous uh, uh, quote in a manifesto uh, attributed to one of these futurist uh, theorists: uh, "A roaring automobile is more beautiful than the victory of Samothrace, the victory, the winged victory that you see at the Louvre." I mean, what an amazing statement! A roaring automobile is more beautiful. It's like very, you know, techy. It could be a wired reader. Uh, roaring automobile is more beautiful than the victory of Samothrace. And and the idea was speed, power, dynamism. That's that's the art of the future. That's that's the beauty of the future. And um, sorry, uh, you know, we live in a world of roaring automobiles. I want to go to the Louvre. I want to see, you know, I want to see, I want to see the victory of Samothrace. Um, and um, just. Again, I, I appreciate your your citing this little passage in the book. I, there, there, in, there's a lot of kind of um, uh, thinking through my life, going back to my days in college. I was a student of Daniel Bell, a great soci- sociologist, who who with, with whom I did the work that I'm I'm citing. I'm thinking about these avant-garde movements, and I and I just concluded that the whole idea of the avant-garde of transforming human character in service of politics through art was pernicious and that it was equally uh, popular on the, on the left and the right. And that it just, it's just wrong. And it's just, it, it shaped me. Uh, I, I think, uh, ever since I was 20, 23 back then, it was, uh, in the, in the probably 1971 or two. So long time ago, uh, but, but ideas that never left me. But so you don't write your novels in the hope that they'll have any impact on public opinion on how people see uh, the intelligence community or, uh, you know, other people in other countries or anything like that? Uh, I try to remember when I write a book that um, this isn't, uh, you know, it's not Tolstoy. It's not we're not writing uh, great literature. These are these are spy novels. And they're they're written to entertain. I want them to be good. I want them to be good spy novels. I want them to be um, uh, interesting for uh, people who, who I want to talk to around a dinner table to, to to read. But but I want them to be to be entertaining, which means that they the plot needs to to go somewhere. It needs to be surprising. Um, in terms of how I think it will shape people's ideas. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to write programmatic books. Um, uh, I, I, wanna, I want you to come away from my novels with a sense of um, the kind of work that real life intelligence officers do. I want you to understand. I mean, for me, uh, if I open the door so that you have a sense of what the Chinese intelligence service is like, this has been terra incognita. It's not written about it most spy novels. What is the service like? How do the people operate? What are their challenges? Where do they work? Uh, uh, That was really fun to to get into. So you'll you'll know more when you come away from it. You'll you'll see the world with with a little more definition. Um, You know, my novel about Iran and the Iranian nuclear program, I, I you know, I think the Iranian nuclear program is dangerous. I don't want them to succeed, but I did want to take you inside the doors of those labs and help you to see who the people are who are doing it, what are the operations to penetrate it, what what are they like. Um, in, in each of my books, I, it's it's not that I it's not that I wanted to tell you uh, what to think so much as as to see how complicated and interesting these worlds are. It, it, in every one of my novels, I think there's a, a, a similar basic um, 
idea, which is that the United States as a country usually doesn't know enough about the parts of the world where we get involved and, and make a mess of things to, to be as involved as we are. My first novel, Agents of Innocence, was about the Middle East and about American machinations in Lebanon with the Palestinians and, you know, I mean, describe some heroic operations, but I think the the bottom line is we don't know enough. And I keep I look back at that book and I, I, I wish that I could say that the basic theme of it is now outmoded that, you know, we, we well, we got smarter. We, now we do know enough. Yeah. We 40 years on, we finally, um, not, alas, not so we, we still keep doing things without having a sufficient base of knowledge to, to get it right. And that, uh, that should dis- disturb me, but do I do? I, am I going to write a, a novel that tells people what they should do? That no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to do that. I just want to describe uh, what happens in the real world, uh, stumbles and, and fumbles and all. I mean, do you ever uh, hear from readers who made a big life change or something after reading your books, like joined the CIA or joined the Peace Corps or traveled abroad, anything like that? A lot of people have said to me, many dozens of people have said over over the 30 years I've been writing uh, spy novels that um, w- when they were thinking about whether this was work in, in the intelligence world was something they wanted to do, that they they read my novels and they, they were encouraged to think this would be interesting. Um, my first novel, Ages of Innocence, um, had a kind of... Uh, uh, weird uh, uh, life uh, as uh, something that CIA officers often would give out to people, whether they were new recruits or people who were expressing interest, um, to say, this is what we actually do. This is, this is like, this is, this is pretty much what, 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 we, what we think our, our job is. And I've had people come up to me when I was traveling around the world and you know, kind of shuffle up to you and say, ah, I can't say who I am. I'm not allowed to identify myself. I just want to say, when I had to tell my mom and dad what I did, I gave me your book. And, you know, that's, um, you know, that, that pleases me because it says uh, it, it, these people who are actually uh, doing these jobs out in the remote reaches say, you basically got it right. This is what I do. And this is how I want people who know me to understand it. Yeah. Uh, a lot of this book involves the S and T division at the CIA, which you describe as sort of being like Q in the James Bond movies. And there are, I guess, robot mice and fish and flies and stuff like yep. that. Or is there a particular piece of uh, uh, spy technology that you uh, have come across that is your favorite? Well, I, I love all those little gadgets. Um, the uh, you know, if you go out to interview somebody at the at the CIA, they let you walk through their museum, including their S&T Science Technology Museum, and you can see these little robot fish and uh, doodads that they've uh, created over the years. I'm sure they're wildly more advanced now. Um, the, uh, you know, I, I, I've, I've always thought the idea of a robot fish swimming up a river to try to identify something is spooky and creepy and sort of what you'd want an intelligence service to do. Um, uh, the one thing that I've enjoyed um, as a writer is getting to know a little bit better the blue collar side of the CIA. There's a sort of fancy case officer world, the guys who do the recruiting, and you know, in our minds we think of them as being Harvard and Yale grads, not so much anymore. Um, but there's this whole blue collar workforce that designs the gadgets, that guards the safe houses, that rents the safe houses, that uh, you know, carries the guns to protect the case officers when they're going out on assignments. You know, it, it's, it's the blue collar side. The, the directorate of support is what a lot of these people work for. And I think it's really interesting. It's just, a, again, it's a part uh, in this. We, we never really escaped the James Bond, Aston Martin, Martini version of, of, uh, of, of intelligence uh, act, act activities. Just look at any movie. But the, the blue collar side is kind of cool. Mm-hmm. All right, no so- touches. <laughs> All right. So unfortunately, we're pretty much out of time. Do you have any just any uh, final thoughts or just anything else you wanted to add? No, except uh, this, it's wonderful to have a conversation that ranges over uh, all of the book and the characters and the weird little things that they say. And I, I the uh, you know, I hope that if people read The Quantum Spy, they'll come away um, if they're wired 
readers and listeners, um, you know, having uh, had fun with the, the technology side, but also having having looked into a world um, as I'm imagining it that's uh, that's different. You know, you, if you ever wondered, I wonder how a intel- uh, uh, Chinese intelligence officer operates. Uh, going after an American target, um, you know, here's my best best guess. So, yeah, I'm I'm glad we had a chance to talk about that. Yeah, well, it's a great book. I really enjoyed it. I'm really, you know, maybe want to read all the other books in the series. And again, for readers, the book it's called The Quantum Spy, and the author is David Ignatius. So, David, thank you so much for joining us. Cool. Thank you. And that was our interview. So, big thanks again to David Ignatius for joining us on the show. Big thanks as well to Sam Cotry, Patty Elizabeth Montet, and Dave, who all just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time or fixed monthly contribution, you can do that via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com crowdfunding. And I want to give a special thank you to John Cormier, who just signed up to make regular monthly payments to the show via PayPal, and to Jack Clark and Jason Brandt, who both just made very generous one-time contributions. I also want to thank Serial Box for sponsoring today's show. Check out their dystopian YA thriller remade, and remember that you can get a discount on the first season of any Serial Box series by visiting SerialBox.com and using the promo code GEEK18. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening. And we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.